I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Once something like eating is death, then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class, but today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. Modernity has created promises that it has no ability to keep. What this means is that we're a society of disembedded individuals um, stuck in the impossible situation of being alone together. And what was understood as emancipation has proved to be a form of isolation. It is important to understand that what I am telling you is not simply a cultural history. It's a description of the story that shapes every single person that you know. This is why there is a rise in mental illness. It's absolutely concurrent with the disembedding of the individual because individuals can't constitute themselves by the very nature of the case. Subjectivity cannot sustain its own weight. We need others to tell us. But we've been given an ethical mandate by the Enlightenment that tells us that that's immoral, that nobody should constrain us. Uh, well, welcome back to another episode of Dust Bowl Diatribes. We're honored to have on uh, Dr. Benjamin Peters, the author of Called to be Saints, a book on Father John Hugo's retreats in the early days of the Catholic worker movement and its continuing relevance for our times. Um, before we get started, uh, we, we like to add, we don't always do this, but we like to ask guests, uh, we're named Dust Bowl Diatribes because we're kind of apocalyptic. We care a lot about the climate. We're, we're kind of prophesying uh, judgment and catastrophe. Do you have a diatribe, Dr. Peters, that you would like to share about what's wrong with the world um, or what's right with the world? Um, that's a good place to start. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I think there's, there, there's, there's a lot out there about what's wrong with the world. And, and so I think maybe it's good every now and then. And, and maybe this just reflects the fact that I'm hitting middle age and I have four kids and I'm trying to say they can't all be bad, right? There's got to be something hopeful. And so um, I, I just read this. Let's see if I can find it. I just read this great book. Um, it came out. I think about 10 years ago now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, uh, Rachel, uh, Re Re Rebecca, um, I think her name is Sol Solnit, S-O-L-N-I-T. But, but the book is called Paradise Built in Hell. And it's stories of, uh, she's a journalist, but she does a lot in this area. I guess there's an academic area of disaster studies. But of how do people re re react in apocalyptic sit situations, like in floods or fires or natural disasters, um, where where the assumption is always, you know, it becomes kind of Lord of the Flies, everyone for themselves, zombie apocalypse, you know, all those TV shows that we watch so often where like like the zombie characters become the least threatening, it's the other human beings that, that, that become the biggest threats. And so what she sort of shows is that what academics in this sort of d disaster training have learned over the years is that that's typically not how people react when sort of the, 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 the kind of veneer of civil society breaks down, that actually mutual aid is sort of one of our almost inherent human instincts, that people care for one another. And, and actually the opening story and this brings us to kind of our conversation here. The, the opening story she uses is Dorothy's description of the earthquake in San Francisco and the long loneliness and how, you know, Dorothy talks about, you know, there was this devastation. People were without houses. There, there wasn't places to go. But nobody told people to do this, but they just gathered what they had and went to the parks and shared food and shared resources. And so this uh, this author of this book kind of goes through various examples from 9-11 to uh, in other countries and places and, and showing where that, you know, that's the recorded history. That That's where the evidence shows of that people aren't just in it for themselves or, you know, um, you know, every every person for themselves in this kind of um, 
apocalyptic way, but rather that there's a there's almost like an instinct to want to care for one another. And so after reading that, it's kind of given me some hope because I think so, especially as we barrel towards the 2024 election in November, you know, you just think the whole society is about to break down and whoever gets elected, half the country is going to be mad. At the other half. But what she kind of gave me hope in is that that's not kind of our natural inclination. Our natural inclination is to care for one another and is to take care of one another. And I think that's very much a kind of a Peter and Dorothy sense of building a society where it's easier for people to be good. So so that'll be my that'll be my plug for some for some um, optimism is that is that I think um, and, and now I think this author actually has a podcast where she where she continues making this argument and showing not in a kind of Pollyannish way, but in a very sort of real evidence based way that that this is what happens when people are faced with, um, you know, uh, you know, a kind of a breakdown of society that, that it doesn't mean that people turn into kind of savages. Um, so so that'll be my opening line there. So that's your anti diatribe. That's my anti diatribe that there is hope to get up in the morning and keep going on. So cool. Cool. paradise and built built in hell, by, by, by the way, is the, is the name of the book. So. Okay. All right. So so what if we transition to can you tell us a bit of the background of uh, Father John Hugo and the retreat movement that he led? Sure. I. I'll start by saying that 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 the book was something that I finished in 2016. So um, other than being on a previous podcast a, a, a couple months ago, I haven't really thought a lot about John Hugo in a while. I, I've been working on another book by a guy about a guy named Gordon Zahn, who I'd be happy to talk about. He's kind of a uh, uh, in, in, important figure in the U.S. Catholic peace movement and also kind of a friend of Dorothy Day's. But but so so I may I may pass over some stuff. So if there's things that that you want me to talk about, please just bring bring, bring me back. But um. But so kind of uh, the, the story of John Hugo was he was a priest from Pittsburgh um, who just kind of missed his annual priest retreat that year. And so was sent up to um, Montreal. There was the Jesuit retreats up in, in Montreal. And he goes up there and he encounters this Jesuit named Nessimus Lafayette who gives a retreat, and Hugo kind of says, you know, oh, the Damascus, the scale fell from his eyes, and he started seeing everything differently, and so he takes on this retreat and really kind of embraces it, starts giving it in, in, in English, the, the, the retreat that Lafayette was given in French. He gives it in English uh, in the United States, and uh, uh, eventually Dorothy Day uh, is is told because she's had some experiences with this Lakatour retreat from other people. Pacifique Roa, who was a who was a Josephite, um, had been hanging out in the Catholic Worker and talking a little bit about it. Also knew Lakatour, um, but he he kind of guides Dorothy to to Hugo, and she makes her first Hugo retreat and kind of has a similar experience where really just th thinks this is the greatest thing in the world. It, I, I think kind of the way she tells the story is since she had converted to Catholicism, hadn't really found a real theological kind of juice to get her excited. And it was encountering that in, 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 in the retreat that other people have kind of referred to it almost like her second conversion. And she thinks this is great. She thinks all of the Catholic worker movement should also make retreats. She starts bringing the New York Catholic workers to to Hugo retreats uh, and develops this real re relationship with them. This this but by, by by the way is all happening during the build up to World War II, which is kind of a significant thing, uh, moment in the history of the Catholic worker mo movement, where you know Dorothy kind of makes the clear pacifist stand that the Catholic worker will be pacifist, and then a lot of as you probably know, a lot of the Catholic worker houses then leave, and a lot of papers close and, and and the and subscriptions to the New York paper drop. And so it's it's sort of a very painful time. But I think what what the Hugo retreat gives Dorothy is a way of thinking about that loss um, in terms of kind of a supernatural um, ethic, right? And that and that that's what she sees pacifism as. And so she and Hugo then Hugo begins to write a lot about kind of conscientious ob ob objection and pacifism too. He's one of the few um, U.S. Catholic priests who very publicly su supports U.S. Catholic conscientious objectors during World War II, um, and so and so kind of, in, and then Dorothy even 
brings Hugo to the to the farm in in New York and tries to get him to kind of make that a base of operations. Um, sadly, not too long after this, Hugo's bishop kind of sends Hugo off to a rural parish so he can't give the retreats anymore. And but then other priests continue to 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 give to give the retreats. And so I think that the 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 theology of the retreat then is something that I that I argue in the book kind of stays with Dorothy. Um, I think you can see it very clearly as sort of the organizing principle of the long loneliness. I think she kind of writes the book with the Hugo or with the Lacatur or the or the retreat the, the theology kind of in 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 mind. But um, yeah, so that's kind of the basic um, I guess history of the relationship between Hugo and Dorothy and why why we're even talking about this now. I think if, if Dorothy had never in, in encountered John Hugo, I don't know if any of us would still even re remember him or or care about the retreat. But um, but but I think because of Dorothy's embrace of it, because she mentions it in The Long Loneliness, um, I think it kind of carries on. And that's obviously what kind of made me interested in in spending time with with the retreat and, and, and learning more about it. Because it was always one of those things, you know, you know, learning as an undergraduate in grad school about the Catholic worker, you always heard of this figure of John Hugo, but there was never a lot of, well, what actually was going on in this, you know, and, and, and not everybody in the Catholic worker liked John Hugo and not everybody in the Catholic worker liked the Hugo retreat. Um, but Dorothy did, you know, and, and, and I think I come back to that a few times and, and that, and that in, 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 in my mind anyways, makes it worth thinking about. And so I did. Can, can you describe his theology a little bit more? Like, how does he actually get to, like, uh, pacifism, for instance? And what other kinds of things did he recommend that really inspire her? Yeah. Well, I I think, you know, one thing is kind of put it, put put the retreat and put Dorothy becoming Catholic kind of in its historical and theological context of kind of early 20th century neo-scholasticism, which was very much a kind of two-tiered view of the world. So there was there was sort of nature and there was the supernatural, right? And 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 these two things were almost like parallel columns. And um and you know and institutions, political institutions, economic institutions, these would fall into the kind of natural category where church stuff and the sacraments, these would fall into the supernatural category. And they could both exist kind of in parallel, but they really they were seen as having to be kept apart. Now, this also then plays into kind of a two-tiered notion of the Christian life, where you have lay people who are dealing with the natural world, so business and politics and things like that. And then you have the clergy and the nuns and the monks, and they're in the supernatural world, and they're worried about their relationship with God. And, and those two things also kind of, over the course of time, come to be seen as almost these separate parallels that really have nothing to do with each other. So I think what, you know, knowing that, I think then what Hugo brings into this, and I think he gets this from Lacatur, who himself gets this from the Ignatian exercises. And, and that's really kind of fundamental to understanding what the retreat was about, was it was a version of the Ignatian ex exercises, right? And, and I think so what he gets from Ig Ignatius is a more, and I think he would want to say that this was a more traditional Christian and Catholic understanding, this, this two-tiered understanding is something that kind of gets brought in at, ar around the Reformation. But if you were to kind of go, you know, to thinking of Christian theology or Catholic theology prior to the Reformation, it was much more of what they would see as kind of almost a three-tier, is, is I mean, the, 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 the best way to explain it, where you have sin on the one hand, and you have nature, and then you have the supernatural. And why that's important is because then, you know, the idea of living a Christian life becomes more than simply not being a sinful person, not being a bad person, right? And, and it also means, though, that, that nature isn't, isn't all there is, that, that nature isn't good enough, right? And so all Christians um, are called to this greater, this, this better, this more perfect Hugo uses terms like 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 the Jesus way or so, like like that like that this is the higher way and so everybody both laity and clergy are kind of called to live this supernatural life and that was something kind of novel in early 20th century U.S. especially um, re re retreats like lay people just weren't getting that message now this is something that that Vatican II with the universal call to holiness is going to become much more affirmed kind of in mainstream. Catholic theology, 
But when Hugo and these guys are saying these things in, in the 40s, that's not something that lay people typically heard, right? So, so one of the one of the payoffs of this would, would be, you know, just because something is is not sinful. So, say a just war, you know, maybe a war could be justified on natural law grounds. That doesn't mean that it's something that will lead us to God, to to lead us to this more perfect way of life that we're sort of called to in the Gospels, right? That 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 what the gospel life is is something that calls us beyond simply the good to the something that's better, right? And 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 I think having that having that distinction between sin and nature and grace or sin and nature and, and the supernatural allows for seeing that yes, okay, maybe maybe there are economic and political institutions that we're not going to say are sinful per se, but they also aren't something that we can discern our avenues towards or or that they present even obstacles to my relationship with God or my living in this more supernatural way, right? Living the counsels of perfection, you know, living, you know, like Jesus called us to, to live, where in the more two-tiered sign, that was sort of seen as, well, that's just not something you need to worry about, right? That's not something that you need to do. And the idea that you would, that you would renounce or reject or give up something that wasn't sinful, you know, I, I think, again, back in the two-tiered mindset, it would be, well, if it, if, if, if nature isn't sinful and only the Jansenists say it's sinful or, 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 or only kind of your very pessimistic Augustinians are going to say that nature is sinful. But if you're a more optimistic, Thomistic, you know, nature is always already grace kind of thing. You know, if if um, if nature isn't sinful, then 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 the idea that you would have to reject or renounce some at some natural institution, some political or economic institution wouldn't make any sense. But I think to have the kind of distinctions that Hugo is trying to make, that again, he's getting from earlier sources with, with back in the, in the Christian tradition, um, I think uh, allows him to say that just because something is not sinful doesn't mean it's something that we should embrace, right? So whether it's war, whether it's certain occupations, you know, um, whether it's voting, you know, Dorothy Day famously doesn't vote, right? And people are saying, well, is that because voting is sinful? And I think it doesn't, and I think in Hugo's seeing of this and the theology he's offering here, you don't have to say that voting is sinful to say it's not something that we should participate in. Or you don't have to say that that capitalism is per se sinful to say that Catholics should not be participating in it, right? And so I think that's the kind of novel thing that I saw in Hugo and really think that kind of he gave then Dorothy a way of, of seeing what a lot of the Catholic worker kind of mission was about and, and, and the life of the Catholic worker looked like. And I think oftentimes people saw her as sort of, well, you're just so, you know, down on things and you don't think, you don't, you don't enjoy the beauty of a good meal or the beauty of nice clothes or the beauty of these things. And you've, and you've rejected all that because you see them as sinful. And I think Hugo's kind of giving her the theology to say, no, it's not because they're sinful that we give these things up. Maybe some of the things are sinful. You know, of course, you know, they, like there's the famous example of smoking that, that Dorothy supposedly quits smoking after she makes the, the, the Hugo retreat. Um, I've had a couple of people, I remember when, when I was, when, I, when the book first came out, kind of give me a vigorous defense of smoking. And I thought, well, if you want to defend smoking as a pathway to God, go ahead. But I think it's hard in my mind. I mean, so, you know, maybe having a nice meal every now and then, or maybe going to a concert every now and then you could kind of, oh, well, this, this, you know, this is something that, that we don't have to give up, but, but smoking was a tough one, but, but, yeah, but, but so seeing, seeing things as, as, as not necessarily just because I'm going to say that we should reject them or we should renounce them means that they're sinful. And I think you still hear that all the time. Well, if it's not sinful, why would you have to give that up? And I think that's where I think Hugo opens the door into, into a, into a very deep vein in Catholic and Christian thinking of kind of the mystical tradition 
where the idea, you know, John of the Cross, or the idea of giving things up, not because they're sinful, but because they turn into obstacles. I, I think that's a big, um, a big component of this theological project that, that Hugo unearthed, that I think Dorothy embraces, um, and that I tried to at least articulate. So, totally. Yeah, Father Hugo used the image from St. John of the Cross of like the bird. A bird can't fly whether or not it's tied by a cord or, or a, very a tiny string. Right. Well, <laughs> to me, there were several like majorly interesting things in this book, but one of them is, is um, what you unearth is that this isn't just like a around World War II theological dispute, like you kind of ground the retreat and you call it Ignatian radicalism. And you cite, I think his name's John O'Malley, definitely O'Malley and uh, Avery Dulles. And, and, then, and then kind of concurring with you that you can trace a kind of genealogy from like Loyola to Balthazar Alvarez to Lalemont, I'm probably butchering names. Basically, there's a whole like minoritarian, more mystical strain of Jesuitism that um, that leads to Father Hugo mm -hmm. and and a, a more I'm in the Neotomism, but more intellectual um, strain that has always been more hegemonic, or at least was until Vatican II. Mm -hmm. um, I guess could you could you expand? Do you have anything else to say about that? Well, one that recently, or not—I mean, I guess not—not—not not, not, not that recent, but with within his pontificate, Francis has talked about his attraction to this more mystical aspect of the Jesuit um, tradition, which, which I think is is one that's oftentimes o o overlooked in these characters of of, of Louis Lalama, who actually we, we we when we just celebrated, I think back last month or in January, the feast of Saint Isaac Jogue and the North American Martyrs. He was a student of Louis Lalamon. So just kind of put Lalamon kind of in, in, in perspective. And um, but but so this this sort of this more mystical side of the of, of the Jesuit tradition that one of the things that I that I discovered that I didn't know a lot about um, was that there was some real concern about Ignatius in the 16th century, and that his writings were, you know, getting a little too far into the mystical tradition, you know, and the Spanish Inquisition is running around and charges of being in the uh, uh, Illuminati and anything that sort of sniffed of this more, um, I guess, mystical branch, right? And, 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 and there are some other figures that I kind of have in there, John of the Cross, obviously, uh, Teresa of Avila. Th these are all figures that are that there was this little window of time where they were writing, but already, you know, that I I I Ignatius was imprisoned a few times for his his writings, and so and so the, and so the Jesuits had to really be careful. And so I think what what you were talking about is there was there was an article I think by Avery Dulles that talked about these two strands within within the Ignatian tradition of um, those Jesuits that focus on discernment of spirits, and that's this more mystical side, and then those Jesuits that that took more of Ignatius's emphasis on working within the church, right? And, and that's that more, they become the more kind of um, neo-scholastic, two-tiered um, kind of branch of, of, of the Jesuits, and that that's the version that wins out because the other version is seen with suspicion, you know, again, if, if, if you put in the context of the, the Protestant Re Reformation and kind of what's going on in, in Catholicism and the fear of a kind of a more uh, mystical side of, of of these writings, they sort of do that out of out of what they see as out of necessity. But this other branch always exists, I, and, I, and I think that's that's kind of what I tried to highlight too. And I think what O'Malley and what what Dulles do a great job is saying that while it's quiet and while it's not the main branch, it's not it's certainly not the version of Ignatius that Jesuit scholastics are taught in formation houses o over the years. It still exists quietly, you know, like 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 so many of the religious communities, whether it's the Franciscans or whether it's it's the, it's the Dominicans. There's the kind of mainstream version of the founder and how he fits in, but then there are always these little streams and and brooks of other sources of ways of thinking about things that exist and kind of get carried on. Maybe not the maybe not the most dominant voices within the order. But but anyways, all, 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 all that to say that that was certainly where these more mystical Jesuits are. And then, 
you know, how Hugo and Lacatour kind of come to read them and find them, right, um, is, is uh, you know, something of a, a of a of a mystical story itself, you know, and, and but but then can kind of bring that in. And I think Hugo Hugo finds these sources and where he actually finds the sources and who tells who tells who about what sources. There's there's some dispute over that, but but I think he finds this. One of the things that I think is interesting about this, and one of the things I, I, I tried to mention in the book is he's doing that, that kind of returning to these somewhat forgotten sources within the Catholic Christian tradition. He's doing that in his sort of pushing back against neo-scholasticism at almost the exact same time that the more famous kind of resource movement within Catholicism is really hitting its zenith in France and in Europe with figures like De Lubac and Congar and Rahner, where they're also kind of in a similar way, although I have I found absolutely no evidence that Hugo ever heard of De, 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 De Lubac or these guys, Although Dorothy certainly read de Lubac, and she talks about Henri de Lubac a lot. So, so she may have mentioned it to him, but that they were doing a similar thing of going back into the sources, right? Not just simply saying, well, what, is, what, what do the Thomists say in their commentaries on Thomas, right? But going back, you know, what were Thomas's sources and what were the sources, you know, since Thomas? And looking for places within the sort of deep and broad tradition to help them. And, and, and I found that very interesting too. You know, I, I, I tried to make, I tried to be careful not to say that, that, you know, that John Hugo was sort of a, an, an American Henri de Lubac, but I do think there was a similarity there that's, that's worth giving him some credit for that, that he did, that he was making this historical attempt to kind of go back to the sources, to return to the sources, resource month, um, in particular, these, these kind of overlooked and oftentimes for, forgotten Jesuits, uh, that, that even he'd say, even the Jesuits have kind of overlooked, right? And here, here, here he is, a, 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 a diocesan priest who's kind of pulling this stuff out. Um, and it's something that then, you know, now, you know, even the Pope's talking about these, these Jesuits. So again, like that Hugo's a little bit, you know, a little bit ahead of the time here, both in the kind of universal call it to holiness, but 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 also in pointing to this. But but just the fact that he's doing it at the exact same time that that these other folks are doing the same kind of work in in Europe, I found that to be very um, interesting as well. And um, and the fact that they're both doing it, pushing up against this broader kind of neo scholasticism, um, I also found. Um, worth noting and, and I think Im, important to recognize um, for for Hugo. So, well, and it is remarkable and kind of ballsy on his part that you just have this diocesan priest in Pennsylvania who's arguing with. You have a whole chapter on like the high level theologians at the Catholic University of America who were writing against him, and he's like citing Aquinas to kind of refute the interpretation they're embedded in. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and of course the, the fascinating part of that is who's ever heard of Joseph Clifford Fenton today, but we're talking about John Hugo. Yeah. Like, but, 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 but you're right. You know, Francis Canal, Joseph Clifford Fenton, these were about as big and important figures in Catholic theology in the United States as you could get at the time. And Hugo isn't even an academic. He's sort of a guy who's working at a parish kind of doing this on the side and the a the fact that they even you know cared enough to to write about him i think says something but also you know now they're completely lost you know and so it, it it gives a sense of where of of how you know like like the 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 idea of what's at the center and what's on the fringes has sort of shifted and now what was on the fringes is now more in the center and what was at the center is now completely lost. Right. There, there's the, there's the famous Michael Harrington quote of, you know, he's, he's at a dinner party with William F. Buckley in, 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 in the eighties. And he says, you know, when the, when the history of U S Catholicism is written, Dorothy, there's gonna be a whole chapter on Dorothy day and Francis Spellman will be a footnote, you know, and that seemed outrageous at the time, but now, 
yeah, who who talks about Francis Spellman anymore? You know, and but there's whole you know we have whole podcasts about Dorothy Day. Um, uh, it seems to be proving right. So, yeah, his name comes up when we're talking about Dorothy Day. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I just want to ask a question about like the the problem of scrupulosity and Puritanism um, in in the context of what he was teaching because I think that's a uh, uh, I mean, that's a danger, I guess, of the kind of um, push towards holiness that um, that he was encouraging, that it's not that maybe he um, was was moving into that zone, but people who follow those kinds of ideas do sometimes have a tendency to move into that zone, which then can cause more, you know, social problems, personal problems. Did he... Um, have was there a component to his teaching that cautioned against that or or solved that problem a bit? Yeah, I mean, because I, I I think that's certainly the big criticism that he gets. That's and that's definitely the big criticism within the Catholic worker that I found. You know, that I think um, to 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 Mar Dorothy's daughter, I guess famously said, you know, after Dorothy died, and someone said, "Well, Father Hugo is all set to do the funeral," and she said, "If he does the funeral, I'm not coming to the." I'm not coming to my mom's funeral. So, I mean, I think she, her, her telling of it is that people would come back from now to be fair. And, and, and I, I think Laura, you, you point this out and I mentioned this. So like Hugo giving retreats was a very small window before he kind of gets marginalized off by his bishop. Then there are, uh, there's a whole series of what are come to be known as re, um, uh, re, re, retreat priests who give, give versions of what they see as the and and so there's already kind of a you know kind of a translation of a translation of a translation so what those folks were, were getting but then also what people were taking away from those retreats and i think that sense of over being overly scrupulous the the term that gets thrown a lot uh, around a lot is per perfectionist right that 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 they were seen as perfectionists, that they were somehow seen as, you know, that this that this desire to follow the counsels of perfection was was not something that lay people needed to needed to do and needed to be so scrupulous over. Hugo responds to this. I I found a few places, you know, where he would say, hey, you know, if you go to a dinner and somebody hands you a steak, eat the steak. You know, it's, it's not that you should only eat, you know, gruel and cold water. You know, you can, if something is nice and somebody gives you something nice, you can enjoy it. It's just, you know, and then he started to focus a lot on kind of that John of the Cross notion of it's when you become attached to eating the steak or when you become attached to, you know, these, 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 these obstacles or these natural goods, what, you know, whether it's, political institutions or stake or just war or whatever else, that that's where the problem comes in. Um, but, you know, I think he's trying to get people, I guess, you know, what I sort of saw him doing in the end was trying to provide lay people. And, he, and there's not many other priests or anybody doing this at the time to try to provide lay people with kind of a pastoral tool for how do I discern daily life in America, right? How do I every, you know, what, what I encounter, you know, whether it's, you know, yeah, the food I'm buying or the kind of house I live in or the kind of job I have or my relationship with my kids or, you know, whether or not I have a 401k, or, you know, all of those kinds of day-to-day -day minutia and questions that people have, Catholics in the modern world have, to give them a kind of a tool for discerning. Is this something that will uh, help me in my relationship with God? Or is it something that will become an impediment to my relationship, with God, even if it's not sinful? And I think, I think oftentimes where kind of Catholic moral theology, even today, lands is, is something sinful or is it not sinful? And I think if that's your kind of, view of discerning American life, then yeah, a lot of things become okay. Well, what are you going to say? Having a $6 million house is sinful? Okay, maybe having three cars is, is it sinful to drive, you know, a Cadillac Escalade? 
I don't know if I could make the case that it's sinful, although there are probably are some good environmental arguments for why driving a cattle, I guess, is sinful. But you, but he kind of flips it to say that's not the question. The question would be: Is driving a Cadillac Escalade going to bring me closer to God? Is what's this going to do? You know, and seeing making that the kind of basis for discerning American life, I think is sort of a it it. it I, I was telling my students the other, other, other day we were we were talking about something and and they don't remember this, but but maybe maybe you guys remember this, but. There used to be those paintings at the mall that would be just a bunch of dots and it would just look like dots, but they'd say, but if you cross your eyes, all of a sudden a sailboat would sort of pop up, right? And you can sort of see, you see the same exact thing, but you start to see things differently. And I, and I think, I think the Hugo retreat gives a kind of a, I mean, the people who really embraced it, like Dorothy, I mean, they really do talk about it as giving them this ability to see things in a new way, right? That, that suddenly it's not a question of is this simply good or bad, but is this that's not the choice. That the choice is between is it good or is there something more, um, which is but but by the way kind of the central question of the long loneliness. Like so much of her story about you know leaving Forrester and, and entering the church, she's telling in terms of that. That it wasn't a sense of my life was awful. I was this terrible person. And then I found Jesus and everything was suddenly wonderful again. It was, no, I, I, you know, she talks about her friends on the left, the old left and Forrester. She describes them as the two great loves of her life. And this is, you know, 25 years after she's converted to Catholicism, right? She still refers to these, to, to her common law marriage and to her, her Marxist and communist friends as the two great loves of her life. And yet they were something that she had, she felt like, had become an obstacle in this more, you know, so, so it's, it's this, like, I, I guess to kind of get back to your question, Laurie, I, I'm always a little bit, you know, it, it always, I always wonder while, while I do think people can get puritanical and people can get overly scrupulous. I, I, I sometimes wonder if that's something that we just use as an excuse for why we don't even bother to go down these, ask these kinds of questions because we say, well, that's just going to lead me to becoming a perfectionist, or that's going to lead me to becoming this. And so I'll just settle into where I am. You know, interestingly, you know, uh, uh, there were some pretty substantial figures besides Dorothy that I kind of found, you know, you, you, Eugene McCarthy, right, the guy who runs for president in 1968, he was very much a kind of a disciple of this Hugo vision of things. And he and his wife, Ab Abigail, were living in this very simple life when he was teaching up at up at St. John's, J.F. Powers, you know, who wins the National Book Award in 1950, he's a big kind of proponent of this, you know, now they both kind of get dismissed also as perfectionists, and there's other kind of terms that, that people use, you know, I, I, I tried to draw kind of a genealogy but, but between using the term Jansenist to using the term Augustinian to today we use the term sectarian, they all are kind of used in a similar way basically to say these are people that we don't need to take serious because they're too they're too rigorous or they're too perfectionist or they're too pessimistic um and um and so it was but so yeah so that's a long answer to to i do think hugo was aware of this maybe he could have been more aware of it i do think a lot of the stereotypes about the retreat though come from either other priests besides hugo or from people who leave the retreat and then tell everybody what it was about, and maybe there was some miscommunication there. Because, because the people who actually took the retreat with Hugo, there does seem to be a kind of a, um, a profound experience that they've had. And, and, and that was certainly the case with Dorothy. And, and that was something that I, I, I remember kind of working through all this material and starting to question, should I even be spending my time on John Hugo, because there was a lot of criticism of him as this rigorist and as this perfectionist. And I kept coming back to, yeah, but Dorothy thought this was important, right? And I think Dorothy is important. And if she thought this was important, then I'm going to keep plowing through all this stuff and, and, um, and, and, and have faith that it is important. And so. Yeah. And while you were talking about that, I kept thinking about how, like in, 
in Father Hugo's uh, back and forth with the establishment. He accused them of having a quote unquote pious naturalism and a, a sin mentality. And specifically, it's that sin mentality that I think, depending the way Father Hugo talked about it, was like, well, when you have the sin mentality, you just think there's basically like a grace nature and there's sin. As long as we're not sinning, then everything's okay. And then from that perspective, the critique of if you're trying to do more than that, either A, trying to do more than that is basically implicitly sinful. Mm -hmm. uh, or you're trying to do the impossible. You're trying to live a kind of grace-filled life. And let's be real, we're sinful. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're just subject to constant frustration. Um, and, 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 and then that leads to charges of perfectionism or rigorism or all this kind of stuff. But, and again, not to say that there weren't people who I think, and I think even Hugo could be annoying. I think I think part of the reason why he does kind of get shut down by his bishop is there's a number of complaints by his fellow priests. And I think a lot of it is, you know, and I, I think I have a great quote there some somewhere in the book about how, how Hugo kind of says, you know, all my opponents are talking about this nature and grace stuff, where really what they're mad about is I said that they shouldn't have preperendials, you know, at night before dinner, you know, which is a great kind of clerical term of basically cocktail hour before every, every, every meal, you know, and he would, and he went into de describing what priest retreats were like and the lavishness of the food. And it was at a country club. And, 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 and the image that was always in my mind, because I think the movie came out as I was writing this, was, was in the movie version anyways of, of doubt. And there was this great scene where like Meryl Streep's character, who's the nun, is sitting in the convent with a bunch of other nuns. And they have like a pot of just gray fluid and they're it's this very grim scene where they're just kind of sitting there slurping up this gruel. And then they flash over to next door at the rectory and there's roast beef and there's cigars and there's wine and the priests and the Monsignors are having. And I thought like, that's the crew that Hugo probably was really talking to. And that's also the crew that probably complained enough to the Bishop to say, this guy, get him out of here, you know, because he's 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 making us look bad or whatever. But uh, so so I think I think clerical culture. I didn't get into that a lot, but I certainly can't believe that that also wasn't part of a lot of this stuff. Was kind of what clerical culture in mid twentieth century looked like, and Hugo kind of um, trying to say, "Hey guys, this 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 really isn't what we're called to be doing," sort of thing. Totally, and and so. The last chapter of your book, we transition from there's the kind of resource mop project about the Ignatian radicalism and how Father Hugo was kind of in lockstep with Blondell and de Lubac. And then in your last one, you talk about how the, the old neo Thomas framework is like largely discredited or like it, it, it still exists among the like so called rad trads. Um, but now we have this new, you describe it as like public theology um kind of the paradigm we've received from john courtney murray um but you talk about how at least if i'm reading you right it's like the same problem in effect has reappeared even with different theological justifications and how before it was this two-tiered thing that like it's the clergy's job to be holy and sanctified and now um there's a more sacramental view of the world where now everything is graced everything is already a kind of symbol leading us to god so therefore we also don't need to renounce everything because to renounce to renounce anything is to renounce what's already graced besides um, sin yes yeah. sin would be the only thing you need to renounce yeah yeah right so i guess could could you expand on that and its continuing relevance for today yeah so so i i I think, as, as you sort of point out, especially after after Vatican II, the kind of neo-scholasticism seems to be discredited more. But then you're sort of it opens it up to this idea that no, that 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 nature and grace don't have to be these separate things, but they can be, they they can be integrated in in some way, or they can be brought together in 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 relationship in some way. And so, what what I was sort of looking at, and 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 I kind of came at this in a bit of a back door because. I was reading, um, even before I got into Hugo, I was part of a Catholic worker community in, in South Bend and, you know, and would be reading criticisms of the Catholic worker movement from, you know, Catholic theologians who were, you know, calling themselves public theologians, right? 
and 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 calling the Catholic worker a sectarian movement or seeing it as having what they kept saying sectarian tendencies. And I started thinking, this is where I started thinking, you know, that sounds a lot like the Jansenist claims, you know. So 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 then I kind of dug a little deeper and I said, well, what's the argument that this public theology is sort of making? And and kind of at the at the core of it is this idea that that nature is always and already graced, right? And that and that this is sort of what this is what Vatican, at least in their telling, this is what Vatican II exposes. This is what the Ressourcement exposes. This idea that we don't have a separate nature separated over from 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 the supernatural, and there's not this two tiered thing. Rather, it's this idea that that you know there's sin, obviously, but then there's this always all, and that the point of the church and the mission of of theology is to is to make that always already graced aspect of nature and natural institutions and human institutions make that more apparent to people right and and i thought well that starts to sound a lot like the kind of pure separate nature argument that the neo-scholastics sort of made that nature kind of operates on its own and it's not sinful and it doesn't necessarily need the supernatural. It can have its own sort of natural goods and all that kind of stuff. And 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 also that the church then really doesn't need to get involved in that all that much. Uh, but also that there's nothing more, that there's a kind of a self-sufficiency there to nature. And so, you know, I guess at, at some point I, I kind of argue in, in, in the book that this already always no, graced notion of nature in effect, starts to act a lot like and is used in a very similar way that the kind of pure nature, self-sufficient nature looks. So as, as you pointed out, Spencer, so if I start criticizing human political and economic institutions, public institutions, I'm dismissed by these theologians for being sectarian, i.e., you know, being too pessimistic about these natural human institutions that what I should be doing is trying to recognize their always already graced nature, right? And I should be embracing that. And yes, always being critical of any sinful components that those institutions have, but that fundamentally these are institutions that are all, that God has already infused grace into. And, and so what that does is two things. It prevents me from from really laboring, from really leveling any kind of criticism, whether it's of war, whether it's of imperialism, whether it's on kind of free market capitalism, it prevents me from doing that without being dismissed as a sectarian. Or if it was, you know, 75 years ago, I'd be dismissed as a Jansenist. But then also, it, it makes it very difficult for me to try to figure out, well, what's the holy path here? What's the kind of, what's the, what's the better option here? Is it just simply to muddle along in this sort of always already graced world of capitalism and, and democracy and, and whatever? Or is there some greater calling that as a, as a Catholic, as a Christian, the kind of gospel life that I'm being called to? And that always already graced makes that discernment that much more difficult, I think, um, and so I was sort of using, I was sort of looking at that as, as a way that this is, this is in some ways, these folks are making a very similar argument that the, then, that the Joseph Clifford Fentons and, and Francis Cannells were making against Hugo. They're making now against contemporary Catholic workers and the contemporary Catholic worker movement or anybody really who's going to critique American institutions on more than a kind of superficial partisan way you know so a public theologian who happens to be a democrat yes they'll they'll critique institutions for what they perceive as their you know their wrong partisan politics just as one who's a republican and michael baxter does a great job with kind of making this argument that that the kind of john courtney murray argument is embraced on both kind of the 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 left and the right of of american catholicism but so any critique though that they're going to label will basically be on that kind of partisan level but any deeper criticism 
any deeper criticism of these institutions of, of war making, the military industrial complex, you know, capitalism, all that is dismissed as well. Now you're starting to go down this other sectarian because you're not you're not realizing that these are natural, you know, human institutions that are always already graced. So um, so anyways, it, it was one of these things that I kind of stumbled upon kind of in a roundabout way. But then all of a sudden, as I'm reading, you know, ha having read all the neo-scholastic stuff and then I'm reading these public theologians, what they're arguing sounds a lot alike and or at least how they see nature as functioning looks a lot like what their predecessors, who they say that they've overcome, you know, because they're going to say, no, no, we don't make the two-tiered split anymore. You know, we're, we're sort of bringing all, all of this together. I think where where Hugo, and I want to say where he aligns up with someone like, like the Lubach or like Maurice Blondel, is sort of saying that nature, you know, this nature grace, they're, they're distinct, right? It isn't it isn't it isn't this collapsed always already. There there is a distinction between nature and grace or nature and the supernatural, but that they're not separate. They don't have to be kept in that neo-scholastic two-tiered um, kind of two parallel columns. And I think you know, and there's definitely there's there's various ways, various uh, analogies that people try to use to explain this that are better and worse. But but I think that's a kind of a fundamental argument that I found very helpful. Then taking this into contemporary arguments where it's not the neo-scholasticism that seems to be the, 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 the prevailing argument, but more this, um, this public theology and this sort of always already graced, uh, you know, grace builds on nature. That, that, that was one of those terms that I found, and I still find today, get sort of thrown at any, any criticism of sort of modern day political or e e economic institutions. It's, well, grace builds on nature, and, and there's this sort of presumption that that means we shouldn't do anything about the nature. We should just put a second floor on top of it. And I think one of the things I discovered is, A, I couldn't find the term grace builds on nature anywhere in, in Thomas's writings or anywhere in the school. You know, what you do find is grace perfects nature. Right? Grace doesn't destroy nature, but perfects it, right? That there's a kind of an idea that grace, that nature is not sufficient on its own, that it needs something more. Um, uh, but but you still read Grace Builds on Nature, and that's still one of those ones I, I always highlight it. I have a whole collection of people who use that term, and they just say something like, it's in the tradition, but no one ever says where in the tradition they're getting it. But it does a lot of work. It does a lot of work for, the, for these contemporary folks. Um, and so, anyway. So just to, so I get it straight, um, what, was, what was the eventual goal for Father Hugo? Uh, uh, was it, I mean, in other words, what were the fruits of this supposed to be? Was it primarily internal um, transformation and truly just getting closer to God? Um, was it more like externally directed as in like the works of mercy, which kind of is, is my way of asking, like, for him, would the works of mercy be more to bring us closer to God or to actually change the material circumstances of poor people, for instance? Hmm. Um, well, yeah, I don't think he would make that distinction. And, and I, I think he would say that growing in your relationship with God does have very real political and economic in, in, in implications. It doesn't have to be this, either I'm going to go pray and work on my relationship with God, or I'm going to go and serve the poor and help to make the world a, 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 a better place. And I think this was this was something that he would have already, already found, I think, in the Catholic worker movement, where there was a very clear notion that, you know, you know, life of prayer and the life of the works of mercy and the life of getting arrested in front of the Pentagon weren't seen as well that's what i do but i don't do that they were all seen as kind of sharing in a kind of a, a common effort and so um i think he would uh, my sense is you know that and especially and this becomes really clear with his opposition to 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 the war is that he would see that you know kind of that old joke if if if, if someone throws a war and nobody shows up can you still fight the war you know so if if people are are discerning in this way, if people are, are, you know, 
are renouncing certain aspects of contemporary American life. Uh, and then on the flip side, embracing other aspects of American life or doing other things, that that is going to have social and political and economic, um, just like people being conscientious objectors to war is, you know, maybe not in the immediate, but eventually is going to start to have an effect on the ability of nation states to fight wars. Um, I think, I think though, what, 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 when you ask that, Laurie, what, what, what it made me think about is I'm a, reading, I, I, I forget who is it that, that told me, actually, it might have been Mike Baxter again, um, that sort of the, that within the contemporary Catholic worker movement, he almost sees sort of two poles, and one is kind of the John Hugo pole, and on the other hand, he sees a kind of Eamon Hennessy pole, and that, and that sort of, you, you could kind of trace Catholic worker houses as leaning in one direction or the other, and that's, I think, too bad, because it wasn't necessarily that they were operating in different things, but that but that a more John Hugo side was this more kind of, you know, taking very seriously the more spiritual and mystical components of the works of mercy and why ultimately you were doing the works of mercy, that this was another thing that brought you closer to God, uh, where the Eamon Hennessy side has that more kind of social justice leaning a- attitude towards it. And, and, and I think stereotypically in a lot of people's minds, is less concerned with the more Catholic or spiritual components of what of what of what maybe Hugo was 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 talking about, um, and I think you know, th- and there's always going to be a little bit of that in any kind of movement that there's sort of these two strands, and I think the Catholic worker to today we could even you know, you could identify houses that that lean more in one or the other. I think there's always going to be a sense of I think Dorothy was good in keeping kind of a hold of both of those strands. I mean, she obviously, nobody was going to question her her commitment to changing the social order, and no one is going to question her commitment to kind of developing her relationship with God and seeing that as the primary reason for what she was doing. So, so I think she's always a great person to kind of have um, as your sort of, you know, guiding light in all of this. But um, but I think sometimes that's that's something that, you know, would also maybe be kind of tossed out at a, at a, at a Hugo as well. He was more into this sort of personal spirituality and not as much into the social justice kind of side. And, and I, I don't think, I don't know if that's a fair um, cr- critique of his. I think he would want to say that, that, that your, our relationship with God is ultimately the source of our c- c- commitment to social justice and, and that sort of a social justice without a deeper commitment to God is, going to end up pittering out or turning into something else or well and how it seems to me like a a through thread in in both what you were saying about hugo and day and like the disputes between like the neo-thomists and the resource mont and now the the public theologians is that um what do we do like life is complicated whether we're talking about supernatural realities or just natural realities life is complicated and it's hard to like integrate it all and hold it together. And do you do you think it's just it takes an extraordinary person like Day to hold together the Orthodox Catholicism and the anarchism? Or yeah, why is this, why do you think it's so hard? <laughs> if I knew that, I could uh, no. Um, it is hard, you know. And I mean, now the 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 the, the best line I ever heard about Dorothy was. That Dorothy wasn't an extraordinary person, and Dorothy, or Dorothy didn't do extraordinary things. She just did ordinary things an extraordinarily long time, right? And and you know, fifty years kind of a thing. And I think, I think there's something to that of, of um, you know, and this goes back to the works of mercy. Kind of, I think in Dorothy's mind, that kind of little way, um, which very much kind of the, the little way of to to raise La Zoo, you know, the, she, she, she writes a book about her, right? I think that very much kind of fits into this um, this more, uh, this retreat the, the theology of kind of, you know, trying to discern God and where God is calling you at every moment, you know, they're, they're within that Jesuit mystical tradition. Um, De, uh, De Kassad has the book, you know, The Sacrament of the Present Moment, right? 
trying to see every moment as a possibility of a sacramental encounter with God. Not that in a kind of always already grace, every moment is a sacramental encounter with God, but at least that it offers that opportunity. And I think, I think for someone like Day, I think where her, you, you kind of can see this in her spirituality is more and more drawn to those daily discerning, trying to find God working in my life as I'm doing the various things I'm doing. And, and certainly being called to, to what we would say was extraordinary actions, but that I think in her mind was a kind of a, a, an ongoing discerning of, you know, whether it's making the soup or whether it's getting arrested or whether it's, you know, speaking before Congress. Um, and, and I don't think, you know, I think she would want to say that that's a not an extraordinary life, that that's a kind of one of the tools that that this that the Catholic and Christian spiritual mystical tradition offers is that this is not over. You know, I always tell my students the works of mercy are not overly complicated. They're not necessarily easy to do, but no one's telling you to, you know, cure cancer. You know, these are very straightforward and simple activities they sometimes are hard to do at the present time, you know, when you're in a hurry and someone's asking you for something to eat or, or you're trying to get the kids home and there's a guy at the corner looking for a place to live. But they, they're very straightforward in that. And, 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 and I, I wonder if, if, you know, if part of all of this is trying to kind of discern, you know, what do I do in these moments? Um, maybe not over the next 50 years, but what do I do right now with this person right here? Uh, and, and I think maybe what's extraordinary about Dorothy is she kind of does that, but just does it for a very long time. And, um, and, and, and I think, you know, in various parts of her writing, she'll say, you know, the more, the more acts of faith you have only increase your faith kind of thing, you know, so, so, so the more you're doing this, the more you get used to this discernment and the more the discernment becomes part of your, part of a, part of a habit of your, of your day-to-day life. Um, that's not an easy answer for why it's hard. It's still hard. Um, but I, I, I think it at least offers, I think the works of mercy offer a very straightforward tool. And, and I guess my argument would be that the Hugo retreat, or at least these ideas of the Hugo retreat offer a tool, a theological tool for helping in that discernment. Um, or if they don't offer the tool that, that works for you, they at least point to the deep resources within our tradition that do help, have helped over the centuries and, and, and um, you know, various places, you know, helped people trying to discern these questions. Um, not always lay people, and I, and I think that's something that maybe is is novel about this, and is something that we that it's important for us to keep pushing at. That this is something that now lay people are also should be using, and and just because I have kids or just because I have a job doesn't get me out, isn't an excuse for me then not to do these things. Where I think that's typically a kind of a well, you have so much to worry about, you know, you don't need to be worrying about this other stuff. Um, um, but yeah, I don't know if that's, yeah, which it's, it's hard. And, 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 and this is something that I struggle with. My wife and I struggle with all the time. And, you know, we, we used to be much more active in the Catholic worker community and now, you know, now we're at soccer practice and, you know, and it's very easy to slide into these other things and, um, and you find yourself suddenly asking, you know, what am I doing here? Kind of thing. And, uh, so. Which, which surely that's part of the utility of whether it's the two-tiered account that says the works of mercy are the nuns and the monks' jobs or uh, uh, the public theology, like, no, that's the job of the welfare state or the market or whatever. It's like, I'm too tired. I'm overburdened. I can't even. And uh, Just don't be a bad person. I, I got, I'm not being a bad person, so I'm okay. Aren't we basically more or less good? Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole, yeah. Jeff That's Bezos what... isn't so bad. <laughs> Driving an Escalade isn't so. I Why well, I keep focusing on Cadillac Escalades? I'm not quite sure, but but. Uh... <laughs> 
I'd be remiss if I didn't ask um, what Morin's connection, in other words, like Morin um, catechized Day, you know, kind of famously, I think that's fair to say, um, and really taught her about Catholic social teaching. Um, and then, you know, she um, goes to these retreats. How close was what Father Hugo was teaching to what Peter Morin had already taught her in a way? Or was there like a significant difference that added on to her knowledge? Yeah, um, that's a good question. You know, I, I didn't spend a, a, a ton of time with that, but that's something that would definitely be worth thinking about. I'm pretty sure, when does Peter Morin die? He dies in kind of the late, is it the late 40s? Um, I want to say it's 39. Was it, is it that? Okay. All right. So I, I, I know, I know at one point, cause Dorothy, one of the things I remember is Dorothy going to, she was one of the few citizens of the United States who goes to lock a, this, this Onesimus lock tours funeral up in Canada. And she writes a column after he dies. And I think he dies in the late forties, early fifties, but she writes about, she compares lock with Peter Morin. Because she says, you know, Lacatour is this French Canadian, grew up kind of in a peasant Catholic family of one of, you know, 300 kids or whatever, and says, that's a lot like Peter Morin, who grew up in a peasant French family, one of 300 kids. And, and so she kind of in that a little obituary, she makes a kind of a parallel between these two figures that she calls two of the most. Now, she's, I think, most of her notions of Lacatour are coming through Hugo. But she calls Lacatour and, and Morin kind of the two biggest in influences on her life at, at, at that point. So I think I think she sees them as working um, as working as not working at odds. I, I think um, I don't know. I was kind of trying to remember if if Hugo ever wrote about Morin or if Morin ever wrote about Hugo. I, I don't necessarily know. I, I do know. I, I think what Peter does, Lauren, I think you mentioned this kind of opens up these sources within the tradition to Dorothy. And I guess what, what I've been kind of saying here is that Lacatour and Hugo do a similar thing for Dorothy. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, 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 I guess the, 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 the only other spot that I, I think that there's some, some, some conjunction is, is when Dorothy in the long loneliness is writing about the end of Peter's life. And how he has dementia and he's losing, he's losing, he doesn't have a lot, right? He's the guy with one pair of pants and one pair of shoes. But she's saying that the one thing that he did always prize was his intellect, his ability to talk. And now that was being taken away from him. And she uses, you know, there's there were terms in the retreat of sowing, you know, casting our seeds off, giving our seeds, giving things away that were our attachments. And that was a voluntary practice. But then, then in a more severe light, there was this idea of being pruned and that sometimes we're involuntarily pruned of our attachments. And that this is also something that Hugo says has a long tradition within Catholicism of seeing suffering then as perhaps having a purpose Right. And so and so but anyways, all that to say, she's sort of describing Peter's the end of Peter's life in the language of the retreat. Um, so I think for somebody like her again, and I keep coming back to her as my like, you know, what did Dorothy think about all of this? If I don't have an idea. And she certainly seemed to see those two like the 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 retreat and what she gets from Peter as working together um, and um, and if not building on each other, at least sort of working in a similar, in a similar um, theological vein. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's all I got there. I should have had more for the, for the Mormon Academy to talk about Peter Warren. But, uh, <laughs> How dare you not know everything about him <laughs> have it on the front of your mind? Uh, speaking well, of me, better I'm, no, people no. are better and not trying to be in a better place or whatever that, that one line he always has I, better off right yeah uh maybe we should just have have guests start reciting these essays if i remember <laughs> uh and i misspoke too speaking of how dare i he died in 49 not 39 yeah. yeah i thought it was a little bit later although i don't think he made a retreat because he was already kind of 
slipping, but so Hugo really kind of takes, kind of shows up around 41. And I think at that point, it, it, my sense was Peter was already kind of becoming a, a, a more, a more periphery figure on the Catholic worker just because of his own, own decline. Well, yeah, unless um, you have anything else to talk about on that front or unless Laurie has any other burning questions, what if we switch over to talking about Gordon Zond and uh, presumptions of justice? Yeah. So so you're writing a book on Gordon Zond. Who was he and, and how's that writing going? Uh, it's good. It's good. I, I kind of finished the, 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 the manuscript and it's under under review now. Um, but yeah, no. So Zahn is Zahn is another one of these characters. I think one of the things that um I've kind of found myself kind of joking that that my sort of academic career or whatever you want to call my kind of writing is focusing on these sort of um, I was calling them B list figures. You're right. So so I, as, as I was saying before, no one ever would have heard of John Hugo if it wasn't for his relationship to Dorothy Day. Well, no one probably would have thought much about Gordon Zahn if it wasn't for his relationship to this more more significant figure, I, I think, at least within history, and that's Franz Jägerstetter. So, so Zahn is a, an American sociologist. Um, he had been one of the 135 or so Catholic COs in World War II who are up at Camp Simon in New Hampshire, this sort of camp that's run as sort of an offshoot of the Catholic worker movement. Uh, he gets to know Dorothy Day there, gets to know Robert Ludlow, a lot, Paul Hanley Furphy, a lot of kind of figures that become big, big figures within the Catholic worker movement, uh, goes and gets his PhD after the war, um, uh, friends with, friends with Eugene McCarthy, uh, becomes one of, which becomes the godfather of one of Eugene McCarthy's children. Um, but anyways, um, goes to Catholic U, studies with Paul Hanley Furphy, again, a, a, one of these kind of really central figures, priest, um, from Boston up in the, um, who's teaching at Catholic U gets his PhD in, in sociology and his big sort of thing was he goes over to Germany after the war to try to figure out on a research project, what were German Catholics doing during the war? And this is right, right in 1950. So the dust has just settled. Um, and one of the things he discovers is that there wasn't a lot of resistance and certainly not as much resistance as I think a lot of the German Catholic church was trying to say there was at the time. But one of the things that Zahn finds is the story of this Austrian peasant named Franz Jägerstetter, who does, uh, when he is drafted after the Anschluss into the German army, uh, refuses to go and gets his head cut off as a reward. This uh, Jägerstetter is married. Jägerstetter has children, right? Everybody he talked to, every priest he talked to, every bishop he talked to said, Franz, you know, I know this is these guys are bad news. I know you believe the war is unjust, but you just got to go fight in it. It's not your job to fit, you know, in this kind of two tiered. It's not your job to worry about, you know, whether you, know, you just go do it. You, you, you give them the presumption of justice that they're right. Um, and he says, no, he says, you know, these guys are evil and, and, and I'm not going to do it. And so um, anyways, so the staff story kind of disappears. Fra uh, Gordon unearths this story, comes back, eventually writes a book that comes out um, right in 1964, right in the middle, you know, just after the Gulf of Tonkin um, resolution has passed and Johnson's ramping up the draft. And a lot of Catholics are starting to wonder, is this a just war or not? Should I even, even if it is a just war, should I even fight in it? Uh, and and this Jaegerstetter book comes out right at the time when, you know, Catholics are still being told. Gordon was told when he went when he went up for the, to the draft board that a Catholic could not be a conscientious objector, right? That that was something that Amish people did or Quakers did, but um, Catholics had the just war theory, and um, and that meant basically that if a government said you should fight in a war, you should go fight in a war. And here's this book by this German or the Austrian, but who refuses to, you know, and, and so it poses directly the question, well, was Franz Jägerstetter wrong? You know, should Franz Jägerstetter just have trusted the German military and gone along with what they said? You know, and nobody's going to say that. No one's going to say Franz is wrong. So suddenly, you know, and, 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 and I've tried to highlight this, suddenly there's this place that, 
that American Catholics, especially young men who are being drafted, can hold on to and say, I know everyone, I know all the priests are saying I can't be a CO, but they can't say that Franz was wrong. And if Franz wasn't wrong, then maybe I'm not wrong either. And a Catholic can be a conscientious. So this start, and, and it, it's funny, I, 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 I remember finding a first edition uh, of, of Gordon's book on Jaegerstetter, which is called In Solitary Witness, The Life and Death of Franz Jaegerstetter. But in the book, it came from a used bookstore. It was filled with, it was from Texas, filled with newspaper clippings from the 60s and the 70s of stories of local kids who were applying to be COs. And it, it just spoke to this book kind of was this, a place of refuge probably for a lot of parents and a lot of people who didn't know, like, is my kid sinning because he's not doing his duty because he's refusing, he's applying to be a CO or he's resisting the draft. And, and Gordon's book on Jaegerstetter kind of gives them a place to hold on to that in a, almost like a ressourcement kind of way that somewhere in the tradition there was this idea of resistance to this to the modern state and 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 that nobody no bishop no pope is going to say that franz jagerstetter was wrong now no one's going to say that everyone else was wrong you know no one goes that far either but they're certainly not 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 not, not going to say that franz was wrong and so um and so, anyways, so this kind of propels gordon uh he event you know he, he kind of stays is a very much a prominent kind of activist academic uh, at one point by the 80s, he's kind of called before the bishops when they're writing the peace pastoral. You know, people refer to him as kind of the dean of the Catholic peace movement, especially in the United States. Um, uh, Jaegerstetter, you know, is, 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 is beatified, interestingly, by, by um, Benedict XVI, you know, Joseph Ratzinger, beatifies Jaegerstetter about two months before Gordon di dies in 2007. Um, so it's just a fascinating story. You know, he's, he's, he's hit... My argument is that his story, his life, kind of tracks the development of Catholic teaching on war and conscientious objector, objection in the 20th century. So Gordon's born 1918, you know, just as World War I is really ramping up, there were four known Catholic conscientious objectors in the United States during World War I, Ben, ben Salmon being the most famous. He's one of 135 in World War II. By the time he gets to Vietnam, there are thousands. And then by the time you get to 1983 and the challenge of peace, the bishops are writing that there are two traditions within Catholic teaching on war, pacifism and the just war theory. And now, you know, now you have meetings in the Vatican where people are making the argument that the church should stop teaching the just war theory. And that, you know, that, 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 that this is a, this is a, this is a theological and intellectual argument that's lost any, any, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think Gordon would agree with that, but, but just to show you how far that swing has come in a very profound change, but all kind of taking place within this one person, he's kind of like the Forrest Gump of the story. So, so his biography also gives a kind of template to really what a, what a profound change in Catholic thinking has taken place over the last hundred years or so um, on, on war and on conscientious objection and on pacifism and nonviolence. Um, something that would have been seen, you know, to get back to my what's at the center and what's on the fringe, something that during World War II would have certainly been argued, you know, um, the arguments for nonviolence and pacifism would have been these fringe arguments. And Zahn is oftentimes the only pacifist in, in in a volume of writing on war, he's the only one making the argument for pacifism or nonviolence, where now, you know, that's completely shifted. And now, in, 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 in many ways, the just war argument is more on the fringe side, at least within kind of Catholic theology. And, um, and the pacifism nonviolence has taken on a much, much more of a central place. So Anyways, that's the book in a nutshell. Um, but yeah, so so I always think like like Hugo's this B-list actor because he's only famous because he knows Dorothy, and Zahn's this guy who's mainly famous for his connection to, to, to Franz Jagerstetter. And I'm here because I'm writing about people who were friends with others. So like 
I guess I'm a C-list academic, then that kind of makes me, that pushes me down even farther. But, but a very fascinating, fascinating ca- character. And, 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 and there was no, no book length treatment of his life. And so I, I thought that was a real, a real gap in, um, in the Catholic peace movement. I, when I was with the Catholic worker, I worked for the Catholic peace fellowship. We were counseling soldiers during the buildup to the uh, war in Iraq. Right. And I knew Gordon's work through that work. And, um, and so I thought that he really, he really de- deserved, um, a, you know, to, to, to be remembered. Um, and so, um, uh, Hopefully this book will get published soon and um, and then it can do that. Yeah. Is it going to be published this year? You, you, well, you know. it's still, it's, it's still in the university press world of it's under, it, the, I, I, yeah, have, gotcha. I have to get back to the readers on some responses and yeah. So hopefully within a year or so. So I, I will have you guys sit, sent a copy and, and, uh, and uh, if, if you like it, we can come back more and talk about the word. No, else Fitzy, you know, I think another thing that I like about Gordon and fits it with Hugo is, and, and this is something that, you know, um, is kind of a bit of a larger picture is that what both Hugo and, and Zahn and Dorothy uh, offer, and I'm getting this argument again from other places, specifically a guy named Mike Baxter, right, who talks about that there's a kind of an Americanist telling of American Catholicism, which is kind of the Murray story, right? That 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 Catholics, um, that that Catholicism and America have always been in tandem. Even if Catholics didn't realize it, or even if Protestant Americans didn't realize it, Catholics in America, you know, uh, America is more Catholic than it, than even the founders realized, right? And kind of making this argument that then turns into the kind of public theology we were talking about. And that that's certainly the dominant story that you get when you hear the story of America. It's, you know, it's, it's the immigrant Catholics coming to America, learning to be better Americans, sending their kids to fight and die in American wars, you know, getting the president to be a Catholic president. You know, that's the, the ultimate success was JFK's election. This proved that we can fit in and and now we have to do all the things that that means, like sacrificing your kids and Notre Dame has a giant ROTC program, all that kind of stuff. And and but then there's always been kind of like the mystical Jesuits. There's always been this other current in American Catholicism that he calls the more kind of Catholic radical tradition that certainly Dorothy and Peter are a part of. But outside of Dorothy and Peter, there's not a lot of other figures that kind of jump to mind. And, and I think one of the things that I've been trying to do with, with Hugo and now with Zahn is to try to highlight that there always have been these other characters who have been much more critical of the United States and much more critical of the United States relationship to Catholicism and Catholics relationships to the United States. And they're oftentimes dismissed and marginalized as sectarians and Jansenists and Augustinians and all those terms that we've been throwing around. But they've always been there and they continue to be there and they continue to be making this sort of, in some ways, kind of the counter argument to the Murrayite Americanist um, kind of argument. And so, and so I guess that that's the other kind of thing that I, I see what I'm doing is trying to at least highlight some other figures, call, you know, point out these other figures that fit into this other tradition, this other narrative uh, that, that I think as American Catholics, we don't always, we don't always hear. I think it's much more that, you know, God, country, Notre Dame kind of rhetoric is much more present um, in American Catholicism. Uh, so, so thanks for giving me a platform to <laughs> spout on about <laughs> For sure. Well, how about for a final question, if you'll humor, we, we part of part of what we also try and do in the show is like, imagine how things could be different. So so if you'll humor a fantasy, what if somehow or other this podcast goes viral? Uh, your book gets endorsed by everybody. The New Yorker is writing a profile on you. Um, the, and, and, and this kind of Catholic radical and not just you, but Michael Baxter and and us and whoever this takes off and we're the new normal in American Catholicism. Um, What 
do you think could plausibly happen um, if if people's mind frames were turned around from instead of presuming that uh, whatever the U.S. military industrial complex decides to do with its bombs is just if we presume the opposite. And instead of presuming that like capitalism can keep expanding forever, we presume that we need to build local, uh, you know, we need to go somewhat back to the land. Yeah, yeah. At least some of us do. Um, could you just kind of imagine what the future you would like to live in would be like? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think you know, I think you know, start so so, and I think what what you're kind of saying and what you opened the the thing with Gordon Zahm is starting with a presumption of injustice. I think if 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 the starting point, if the question, you know, so think of Hugo. If the question is not is this sinful, but rather is this an obstacle in my relationship with God, right? If that's the first question you ask when you encounter some aspect of daily life. So if if the question that Catholics begin to argue uh, is looking at something and saying, I don't know if I should participate in this unless it can be proven to me that it is something that is at least just, if not a pathway to, to, to God, um, you know, then what you would get, and, and, and I kind of get this from, from Gordon, then you kind of get, I think what you would get is little pockets more and more, what, what he would kind of call, and what I would kind of call kind of pockets of resistance to, and I think this is where my hope would be that a Catholic parishes could function in these terms, right? And this is why I think Peter Morin thought every Catholic parish should have a Catholic worker house connected to it. Because if uh, the parish model already, kind of, they're already there. You don't have to like build anything. You don't, it already has the kind of infrastructure set up all over the country. But to give people a place to come to help them do this kind of discerning, right? And I'll, I'll give you a, like, like a brief example. So we have, my wife and I have four kids and, and the best we can do with the cell phone is to say, we're not going to get you a phone until you go to high school. And when our kids were like in third grade, all the other parents were like, that's great. We'll do the same thing. But then every year it's like a gradual melting away until like, it's just supposedly, although I don't think it's always that case, just our kid in eighth grade who doesn't have a phone and everybody else has a phone dad everybody else gets to do all these things i'm being left out i have no friends and, and i think to myself a that can't be true but b i have no way to prove it because i'm not going to interview all these other people and say remember you promised there but i i keep thinking but that's something that a, that a parish could do a parish could help people support one another if nothing else in these thinking about ways of whether it's resisting sort of the capitalist consumerist, you know, God ever consuming God of just more and more stuff. And if you resist that at all, people look at you funny, your kids tell you you're being a weirdo, you know, but then also on this broader plane, you know, I, I taught um, every now and then I'll teach classes for the, for the deacons. And I remember a few years ago having this guy who was, who was, you know, studying to be a deacon but he worked for um, Pratt Whitney here in, in Connecticut, building jet engines on the military side. So Pratt has their civilian side and their military side. And this was just when this, all the news about Saudi Arabia's involvement in Yemen and kind of these atrocities. And it also came out that the Saudis had planes with jet engines in them made in Connecticut at the Pratt Whitney plant. And this guy was saying, I don't think I should work for Pratt and Whitney anymore. You know, I don't think this is something I can seriously, maybe you could argue it's just, I don't, he, he, he would even say at that point, I think he was to the point where he was kind of almost participating in sin. But other than me and my class, he had nowhere to go to talk about that. Because if he went somewhere, they would just say, don't worry about that. You got kids. You know, you're not dropping the bombs. All you're doing is building this one little component of an engine that's got millions of components. You know, don't, almost like the Jaegerstetter, don't worry about that. Just, and I think like there are, there are a lot of Catholics and a lot of people in general, but certainly Catholics who are asking these questions and they just don't know where to go. And I think if, 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 if the question asking could be a more 
mainline thing in, in, in our kind of fantasy world here, then I think you could have, you could, we, we, we could see kind of Catholic formation and Catholic institutions as being places that could help people, help people resist this in, 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 in whatever way they, you know, again, whether it's in a more, what, when do I get my kid a phone to, should I be living in the suburbs? Should I be, should we be welcoming undocumented folks to live in our basement right now? You know, like, so what should we be doing? And when it seems like it's just you doing it, it's much harder than when there seems like there are other people, you know, other people who are doing this. And, and I think that was the beauty of kind of the Catholic worker is that there's other people like the, like, you know, Dorothy's line about the solution to the long loneliness is community, having other people around you, um, certainly helps. Now that's it's not always possible. Franz Jägerstetter didn't have anybody else, although he always looked to the saints and things like that of other folks to pull out. Um, but, but so, so I think that would be, I think one of the benefits to kind of s starting to make those kinds of questions, the first questions that are asked, the kind of main questions that, that are asked, I think that would then give, open up then opportunities for people. I think, cause I, I think, people really are asking these questions, maybe not about, should I quit my job at Pratt Whitney, but certainly, you know, about the phone thing and seeing their kids growing up on in sort of Instagram induced TikTok comas and, and not, and feeling completely helpless and not knowing almost like they're sacrificing their children to something and they don't know what to do. So they just, watch you know and 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 i think the same thing you could say if you know when wars happen you just stand even if you have concerns you don't feel like you can do much and you stand back and watch while your kid goes marching off and um yeah so i guess that's my that's my that's my little way there to to to, to make a another plug for um to raise right that that if if we could build co communities like that, and 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 I do have faith that Catholic parishes could still provide, um, still provide at least the initial step. Then maybe you do have a Catholic worker house connected to it, or you do have some other kind of the next step. If somebody, you know, it's it's hard for to get people into the Catholic worker house from you know, but that's a gradual thing that you could start to get people as they go down this path, and as kind of like getting back to Dorothy as you're doing these little things over and over again, suddenly the step doesn't seem as big then to, to, to move to a farm or to move to a house of hospitality. That leap isn't as large anymore. It's, it's a much more uh, manageable thing. So when, when that happens, stay tuned because because we'll, you'll have more volunteers and you know what to do with at your Catholic worker house. We'll be busting at the seams. <laughs> Right. But in the meantime, it's just a lot of doing the small, simple, the sacrament of the daily moment. Yeah. You know, we're reading your book. There was a bit of like through the looking glass is like, you know, Dorothy caught hell for being against World War II. But I feel like in a minor way, I get a similar look when I'm just like, hey, guys, could we compost? Yeah. You're like, no, no, I, yeah, yeah. no, we just we just can't. It, it's too much. And then when you. When you try and make the argument, well, like, well, it wouldn't be too much if, like, we all did it. They're just like, well, no, no. Would they just, it, it seems to me that these radical centers, you know, like what Hugo was trying to do, they're very hard to hold. And it's way easier to be like, I'm a neo Thomist, I'm a public theologian. Um, either all the wars are just or whatever, go kill, go get killed being a Jaeger stotter. Yeah. Yeah. Don't suck me yeah. into your utopian dreams. And like, but, and like, is com and, and 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 composting? You know, it's such it's such a little thing. You know, you're not saying let's like you know all become vegan and and you know grow our own food. It's like let's just do that. And it's these little steps that you know. I, I remember we talked about we we talked about this at times in my class. But I remember you know asking once our our lawnmower died at my my in my house. My our you know we don't have a huge lawn. We live in the suburbs, and but our lawnmower died. And looking at prices for a lawnmower and then thinking, wait, both of my neighbors have lawnmowers. You know, why do we all, why do all of us need lawnmowers? Like, couldn't we share the lawnmower? So I would ask the students that and they would think, 
Oh, I would never want to do that because the guy's not going to take care of it. Or then when you want, I like, I only use the lawnmower like 45 minutes a week for like a couple months a year. Like, do I need it sitting in my, couldn't the three of us. So you start to think of ways of kind of pooling, doing things together as a community that then, you know, oh, no, 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 you, you can never do that. Nobody would want to share a lawnmower, you know? So just these little things. I think we, we had this kind of knee jerk, um, and and not to keep bringing things back, but this gets me back to that book about the natural disaster. Like, I think we have this assumption as Americans that everybody's a jerk and that nobody wants to do these things. And I think what she's opening up, at least this idea is that, no, maybe this idea of people wanting, you know, I, I, I always think that 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 notion of building a society where it's easier for people to be good. The presumption there is that people want to be good. People want to do the right thing. They just don't know how. Where I think oftentimes our kind of American assumption is, no, people are jerks. And you have to make them just not be jerky. Like, that's why we need the police and we need the military. But I think what this whole other branch and what I think Dorothy had long argued and all the mutual aid kind of folks have long argued is that, no, that's that's not true. People do want... They just don't know maybe what to do or how to do it, or they don't want to be the only one doing it because then people are going to roll their eyes at them or their kids are going to complain that, why are we doing this, Dad? Like, why do we have to do this? Well, thank you for coming on and being part of our Moran podcast community. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. This was fun. This was a great conversation. Makes yeah. me think I need to go do something now. I, I need to go and like <laughs> some, do something little, but do a lot of it, so. Yeah. yeah, thanks. It was great. And um, we hope to have you back when you get your book published. Sure, sure. All right.